good evening and uh, good morning everyone from whichever part of the world you are joining in uh, so today we are very excited to have professor hortens fong with us um, uh, i'll quickly introduce uh, professor fong here she's an assistant professor in quantitative marketing at columbia business school um, she is doing some pioneering work and very cutting edge stuff that uses machine learning econometric analysis and experimental methods to study how emotions impact consumer behavior and taking advantage of the rich unstructured data text images video music that are increasingly available uh, a distinguishing feature of our machine learning interest involves going beyond the classic use in prediction to study how to incorporate domain specific theoretic and managerial knowledge into ml systems and make ml systems more integratable and that's exactly the work she is presenting today as well she also has a broader interest in questions at the interface of marketing and society example fairness especially when it relates to the widespread adoption of ai in various business and marketing settings we are very very thrilled to have her with us um, she has written an awesome job market paper which i'm sure she is revising i have read it many times so i'm very excited to it's a very different feeling when you read someone's paper and then the person is uh, they are right in front of you uh, talking about it i'm very very excited to and we are very thankful to her uh, for accepting our invite so without further ado i hand it over to you hortens thanks a lot Thank you so much, Anita. That was uh, such a kind introduction. Uh, thank, thank you for this invitation. I'm really excited that I have this opportunity to present my work to all of you. Um, I'm happy to take questions anytime, so just feel free to interrupt. So I'll be presenting uh, this paper, a theory-based explainable deep learning architecture for music emotion. I'm an assistant professor at Columbia Business School, but this is joint work with two professors at Yale, uh, Vinit Kumar and Kay Sadir. So this paper, as the name implies, is about using a deep learning model to predict the emotion that's elicited by music from the unstructured raw data itself. Uh, we know deep learning models are often good at prediction, but uh, you know some concerns about them is they're also often viewed as black boxes in that we don't really know why the models make the predictions they make. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take theory from psychology, from uh, music theory, to design the deep learning model in order to gain explainability of the model, but without sacrificing its good predictive performance. And the reason that I'm interested in this problem is we know from the behavioral literature that emotion impacts the customer uh, journey throughout. And music is one of the key drivers of emotion. So with all that, uh, let me get started. Oops. There you go. Okay, so music has often been called the language of emotion. It has the ability to elicit a wide range of emotions. I'm going to show you two ads that raise money for the ASPCA a nonprofit here. Now, these two ads are the same in every way, except in their background music, but the background music completely sets the emotional tone. So as you watch, take note of how you feel. And here's the second one. So perhaps as you watch the first one, you felt positively and energetic. But as you watch the second one, you felt a bit more negative, lower in energy. And these feelings map onto an emotion framework that was proposed by Russell back in 1980. The idea behind this framework is that all emotions can be mapped onto two underlying dimensions, uh, valence, which measures how positive or negative you feel, and arousal, which measures how energetic or calm. And so I'm going to use this framework here to operationalize emotion in my model, but ultimately the ideas are going to be agnostic to how I define emotion here, so I could very well instead use, say, a discrete framework, um, so emotions like joy, sadness, fear, disgust, and the reason I can do that is because there is music theory that ties different features of music to the emotions that uh, the music elicits. 
Now, I'm going to study this problem because we know that music is a key driver of emotion and uh, music is almost ubiquitous in advertising. So a uh, study of the different of content in ads found that 94% of ads use music and that 75% of the time in ads uses music. So I'm gonna in particular focus on this piece of unstructured data, which hasn't been as explored in the past. And the particular application I'm thinking about is this one of ad insertion within videos. Uh, again, from the behavioral literature, we know that emotion that's induced by content will impact how effective an ad is. Um, so first we're going to think about uh, this content video and this content video varies in emotion over time. So suppose we're thinking uh, Hamilton the musical. So Hamilton begins high valence, low arousal. It then quickly becomes high valence, high arousal as Hamilton makes a name for himself. And then uh, we know how the story ends. It ends on a more tragic note. So ends low valence, low arousal. And ads, as stated before, often also elicit a particular emotion. Suppose we take the second ad from before, which was low valence, low arousal. We know from the past literature that the interaction of the content emotion with the ad emotion impacts how effective an ad is. So then we're gonna ask the simple question, which is where should we think about inserting this ad within content that varies in emotion over time? And music is often designed to elicit the intended emotion in the video content. So here, we're really going to use the music emotion as a proxy for the video emotion. So we're gonna abstract away from say the images, from any uh, speech, so any of the, um, the text information that might be in here and really focus on the background music. Now, if we're thinking about a context like YouTube and ad insertion, there are billions of videos, millions of ads. So if we wanna think about this problem, we're going to need a model to do this at scale. And so that's exactly where this model comes in. Now the exact question, uh, well, maybe Lucy, so okay. What is the optimal emotion-based ad insertion point? When I say optimal, let me be a little bit more precise. In particular, I'm thinking about two ad outcomes, two you can think more revealed preference type outcomes. So one is going to be the ad skip. Uh, so for YouTube videos, we're going to be thinking about the mid-roll ads. So there are the ads inserted at some point within the video. You might remember last time you went to YouTube, you had to watch the first uh, five seconds. And then at second six, you had the option to skip the ad. And so we're going to take this ad skip as one uh, revealed preference measure. And the second will be brand recall. So after all individual, after the individual um, in the experiment watches the video with an ad inserted at some point, uh, can they remember which brand advertised within the video? Now, let me quickly just go over the main contributions of the paper, um, and this will serve as a nice overview for the rest of the talk. We only have 60 minutes, so it's not the longest, so I'm going to spend probably uh, a large chunk of today's webinar on the modeling aspect and just um, give you a quick preview of the application. Uh, the real, I think the main focus really is in the modeling, and so I'm going to spend a lot of time um, communicating exactly how we think about designing the deep learning model to incorporate the theory. So this model is going to predict the time varying music emotion, and in particular, we're going to develop novel convolution filters, or you can think the basic building blocks of a convolutional neural network based on music theory. So the current models that have applied deep learning to computer vision have often used these CNN, these convolutional neural network models. These models were really designed with computer vision in mind. Um, the problem is uh, how we see is very different from how we hear. And so these models aren't necessarily consistent with music theory. So instead we're gonna very explicitly incorporate music theory into the design of these filters and these filters will bias model explainability, but without reducing the good predictive performance associated with deep learning models. Then with this model, that's not only explainable, but also accurate, we're going to apply it to this problem of emotion-based ad insertion. And first we're gonna conduct a behavioral lab experiment in which we find that Emotional similarity between the content and the ads is what improves advertising brand recall. 
And then knowing this, we're going to then uh, apply your model and see if it can identify the points in the content that are most emotionally similar to uh, different ads. And we're going to do this um, in a way that allows that is very scalable. So I saw that there was a, a question, but I had um, or a comment. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, should there be another experiment where the sad emotion appears at different point on the video to account for position effects. Uh, it's probably they're talking about mid roll versus- uh, Right, so for example, and, yeah. at the, be, be more effective than at the middle. Right, so that's a great question. Um, so we, uh, I think that's exactly what we're do. We're going to take the, the ads that have different emotions. So maybe uh, you can think sad or you can think happy and we're going to insert it at different positions within the video. So you can think um, if the video is six minutes long, let's say it'd be inserted at minute one and then maybe minute two, minute three, minute four. And indeed we find that ads that are placed earlier typically uh, do better. So there is a position effect and this is consistent with the past literature. But then um, once you control for that position effect, then the interaction of the emotion with the ad content also matters. And in particular in our um, application, what we find so far is that emotional similarity is what is effective. Okay, great. Uh, let, yeah, let, let me know. If, if anything else. Okay, so then now let me go over the approach that we're going to use in our model. We're going to begin with the, uh, let's begin with the input. We're going to start with the raw music. So you can think that's a uh, waveform. Um, it's going to be just like the amplitude of the music over time. And we're gonna convert that raw music into these spectrogram images. And uh, in particular, we're gonna focus on these six second segments and we're focusing on the six seconds because this is really with the application uh, as motivation. So individuals have to watch the first six seconds. At second six, they have the option to skip. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, if we say have a 30 second clip of music, we're going to break it down into uh, five non-overlapping six second segments. Then each of these images we're going to input into a deep learning model, in particular, a convolutional neural network. And here we're going to apply our music theory based filters. And then the model, the CNN, will predict the emotion that's evoked by the music. And here, just to be uh, very clear, we're going to define emotion as measured by this valence arousal framework. We're going to discretize this framework into uh, four quadrants of high and low valence and high and low arousal. Now, our model really has two objectives. One is explainability, the other is accuracy. But the problem with having these two objectives is they're often believed to have a trade-off. And here, let me just be quite explicit about what I mean by explainability. We're gonna borrow from Ribeiro et al. 2016. It's the ability to provide a qualitative understanding of the relationship between the input variables and the response. So on the one side, this top left corner, we have uh, traditional machine learning models. So models like you can think linear regression, support vector machine. And with these models, we've used, we use handcrafted features. Um, so in marketing context, you could think about things like uh, uh, RFM features, so recency, frequency, and monetary value. But on the other side, so the lower right, we all have these, what I'm calling for now, atheoretical deep learning models. These models are very accurate in their predictions, but they lose in explainability. What we're going to do, we're going to try to combine these two ideas here. And we're going to do this by taking uh, theory that's more often associated with the traditional machine learning models and these handcrafted variables, we're going to uh, take theory, we're going to impose some, um, you can think guardrails on the structure of the model. And what this will buy us is explainability, but without losing predictive accuracy. Now you might ask, okay, but if we have something that's predictive, why do we even care about explainability? And I think that's a very fair question. So explainability is important for a number of reasons. The first is that managers need to have trust in predictions in order to be willing to deploy models at scale. So in 2020, McKinsey conducted a survey asking firms what they worried about when it came to using AI. 
And after um, regulatory compliance and cybersecurity, explainability was what managers worried about most. And second, explainability enables or increases the ideas or beliefs around generalizability or the robustness of a model um, to other settings. So outside of the data that the model was trained on. Uh, I like this quote by an Uber AI researcher who says, if your system doesn't work and you don't know why, well, it's quite hard to improve it. So just to make these ideas really concrete, I'm again gonna borrow from this Ribeiro et al paper. In this paper, the authors asked a really simple question. They asked, can we classify pictures of wolves versus huskies? Uh, you can see here that these two uh, animals, they look very similar, but in fact, you know, one is much more dangerous than the other one. So you wanna get this prediction right. The researchers, they were able to build a classifier with near 90% accuracy. So that was great. But when they went to look at why, what they found was that the uh, model, the classifier didn't use the animals themselves in the prediction, but instead used the background. So a white background led to a wolf classification. A green background led to a husky classification. But it's easy to think about counterfactuals in which you might have, say, a husky in snow uh, within a white background. So although this model was very accurate, clearly this model isn't generalizable. And so what explainability buys us is an idea of whether the model is learning features that either can or cannot generalize outside of the data that was used to uh, train and test the model. Okay, so with that, I hope I've convinced you of the importance of having explainability in models. Um, and now let me get into the actual approach I'm gonna take. Uh, and let me just quickly begin with the output to give you a clear idea of how music relates to these uh, different quadrants. So our input will be the will be high dimensional x variables, and the prediction goal is to predict for each six second clip which of these four valence arousal quadrants a uh, clip falls into. So this first clip was classified by human listeners as being low valence, high arousal. And then this next clip was classified by human listeners as being high valence, high arousal. And I guess maybe one thing I should point out here is when I say high valence, high arousal, I guess I mean on average, people are going to have different subjective responses to music. Ultimately, emotion is something that's uh, subjective. It's uh, based on perception. Um, so we're just going to take, you know, the, the average, you can think, modal response. And so we're, for each six second clip, we're going to predict which of these four emotion quadrants the clip falls into. And now let me just spend some time talking about the input into the model. I'm going to go into a bit of depth here because it's important to understand what exactly the input is to understand how we're going to design the filters to take um, advantage of the information that's captured in the position information here. So we're gonna, we begin with the raw music waveform. We plot the amplitude over time. And you can think, okay, well, this waveform, this is an image. We can think about inputting this into the deep learning model. But the waveform maybe isn't the best option because it's not really reflective of how humans hear. Um, and so what's important to remember here is that sound is ultimately composed of different sine waves that have different frequencies and magnitudes. Frequency is associated with pitch and that higher frequency is associated with a higher pitch. And magnitude is associated with loudness and that a higher magnitude is associated with a louder sound. Two waveforms can map to the same sound, doesn't really reflect how we hear. So instead, we're going to take advantage of the function that we know, I guess the mathematical operation, that it better reflects human hearing, which is the Fourier transform. So uh, if you put some sound into the Fourier transform, it's going to extract the uh, associated frequency frequencies and then the magnitudes associated with each of those frequencies. And if we do that for short overlapping time windows, we can create this uh, spectrogram. Um, in particular, we're going to create a mouse spectrogram, which just shows in two dimensions uh, the frequencies over time. So 
On the vertical dimension, we have frequency. On the horizontal dimension, we have time. And color represents the intensity of each frequency at each time point. So a dark blue represents the lack of a particular frequency being played at a time. And a dark red represents a um, high magnitude of a particular frequency being present. So you can see 0 to 3 seconds, the frequencies are a little bit more compressed. 3 to 6 seconds, the frequencies are more spread out. And indeed, the most common approach that has used deep learning for sound is to use a convolutional neural network, a CNN, on the MEL spectrogram. OK, so I, now we see another question popped up. Um, emotion associated universally consistent on average across cultures. No, that is a fantastic question. So let me just address that now. Um, Certainly not universal across cultures. What I'm focusing on here and the music that I'm going to use to train my model will be based on Western music. So, you know, probably unfortunately, um, a lot of the theory here, uh, at least in the text I've been reading, really focuses on Western music. And so um, there's still, I think, a lot to be studied for other uh, other types of music. Um, but in particular, you know, Western music, a big part of emotion is going to be the harmony of the music, but there are other cultures that focus more on, say, um, tempo to drive emotion, or maybe focus more on melody to drive emotion. Um, so this is not something that is necessarily going to be consistent across cultures. So I wouldn't just uh, pick up the model that I'm going to introduce here and use it in all other settings. But that said, I think there are a lot of ideas that can translate and you can think about using these ideas to um, incorporate for other cultures the relationship between uh, music and emotion. Okay. So now let me get into the model and I'm going to um, talk in particular, let me start just giving a very quick introduction of the convolutional neural network. Uh, so this is a very standard picture of a convolutional neuro neural network. Um, you've probably seen it before. Uh, CNNs were really designed with computer vision in mind. So here on the left, we have uh, input images. And on the right, we want to classify uh, what is the vehicle in each image. And CNNs, we can really break down into two parts. One is the feature le learning portion. And this portion will automatically learn features of the data that is useful for classification. And then in the second portion is the classification bit, which will use the learned features to estimate the probability of each class. And what's going on is for each of these different blocks, there are a lot of simple operations going on. Uh, they're not complicated, but there are a lot of operations, which is ultimately what makes all of this uh, viewed as a black box. But computer scientists have made a lot of progress in understanding what CNNs learn uh, when it comes to images. And they've done this by looking into each of these various blocks. And what they've learned is the earlier blocks are learning, say, simpler ideas. So things like, oh, is there a vertical edge? Is there a horizontal edge? Things around textures. And then the later blocks are learning more and more complex ideas. So maybe things around, say, you can think shapes. And then maybe later it'll be things like, oh, you know, this is a tire, are these headlights? Um, and then based on these features, then they'll try to estimate um, the probability of each class. Now, when it comes to um, music, though, what we want to understand is uh, for what is our model learning that will classify the emotion of music. So we I hope that it will pick up features that are related to music so you can think things around like, harmony, tempo, harmonics. Now, let's get a little bit more into the convolution filter, which is really what is doing the heavy lifting for CNNs. And what's key to CNNs is this idea of, um, well, maybe, sorry, I should say CNNs. So what's key to this idea of image recognition or computer vision is this idea of local information. So we have this grayscale image here. You can think about this just as a matrix of numbers. And this, convolution kernel convolution filter is this three by three light gray box. It's going to slide across that grayscale image and up and down. And these uh, nine numbers, this three by three grid, it's, these are weights that are going to be learned to extract features useful for uh, classification. So just to be a little bit more concrete, it's helpful to look at these uh, weights on the right. 
um, here, we know what these weights learn. They're going to detect whether there's a vertical edge in the image. So to see this, what's helpful is you go back to that grayscale image, look at a three by three portion where there's no vertical edge, these pixels are all going to be the same. Then when we multiply by the weights, add the numbers up, the filter is going to output a zero. But if instead we go to a part of the image where there is a vertical edge, the pixels to the left and right will be different. When we multiply by the weights, add the numbers up, the filter is going to output a non-zero value, um, thus telling us that there is a vertical edge that's present in this, uh, like certain portions of the image. The problem of using these sorts of filters for music is that there are really important musical features that rely on non-local information. So for example, we can think about um, certain combinations of notes. Uh, so this is really, we're thinking about harmony here. So we have octaves where we have some fundamental frequency, F0, so the lowest frequency associated with note. And we're going to also play the note that's one octave higher, so two F0. The sound octave is often described as being pleasant or consonant. But there are other combinations of sounds that are sound jarring or dissonant. So a classic example is the minor second. You have the fundamental frequency F0, and then you play another note, 25 24 F0. And so the minor second, for example, is often associated with horror movies. And there are many different features of music that are associated with emotion. So for example, high arousal music is associated with a fast tempo, loud music, high harmonics, a dissonant harmony. Low arousal music is associated with a slow tempo, soft music, low harmonics, and a consonant harmony. And then high valence is associated with consonants. Low valence is associated with dissonance. And uh, in, this motion emotion, in this music emotion recognition literature, uh, typically, models have had a much easier time judging high arousal from low arousal, but a harder time judging high valence from low valence. And so here we're going to really focus on valence in particular in the design of our filters, because this is what past models um, have had trouble with. Now, the key idea behind the filters relies on this concept of harmony or this, this idea of consonance and dissonance. So let me be very precise by what I mean here. Consonance is a combination of notes that sound pleasant when played together. Dissonance, a combination of notes that sound jarring when played together. They're really opposite ends of the same spectrum. And that sound pleasant, that sound jarring, these are ultimately perceptual features. But these perceptual features relate to underlying physical properties. And so there are certain um, relationships in the frequencies being played that lead to these different uh, perceptions of music. And we're going to borrow from this um, chart that uh, two um, uh, scientists gathered by uh, doing the following. They took a bunch of participants and they played two notes for them. One note remained fixed at 250 hertz, and the other began at 250 hertz and increased to 500 hertz. And they asked individuals uh, to rate the consonants, uh, or you can think the inverse, the dissonance of each sound. Um, so if we look at this, if we look at this here, um, this graph here, we can see that uh, unison, octaves, fifths, and other simple ratios between the two frequencies played led to um, local max in consonants. And so it's these relationships that we're going to take advantage of in designing our filters. In particular, we're going to design filter, we're going to design filters that are motivated by octaves, by fifths, and then the underlying idea that ties together all these different ratios will be this idea of uh, overlapping harmonics. So whenever you play a note, you have some fundam fundamental frequency F0 that's played, and then it's um, harmonics or it's integer multiples are also played. And if you play multiple notes, um, you know, their integer multiples will be played. When a lot of those harmonics overlap, you have a more consonant sound. When those uh, harmonics don't overlap, you have a more dissonant sound. So we're going to design filters that capture the frequency relationships that are associated with consonants. 
Okay, and then one final thing, I think this is another um, good point to add to the question asked earlier about you know, what translates. So Western music is organized by the 12 pitch classes, C, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, so on and so forth. Um, other types of music have other scales. So the, this is something that would have to be adjusted for other types of music. Um, but it's a way to organize music in Western music and it's gonna be how we're gonna or organize the filters in our model. So if we're focused on say the pitch class C, then we would uh, think about frequencies associated with uh, C2, C3, C4 when it uh, comes to octaves. Okay, so finally, uh, now I can show you an example of a filter that we've designed with um, octaves for the pitch class C in mind. Um, so on this left, we have this black and white column. And essentially the black portions are going to zero out portions of the image um, that aren't associated with octaves for the pitch class C. And the uh, white portions or the visible portions are going to be the weights that are learned to combine the information that is left um, here when we're thinking about octaves for the pitch class C. Uh, so how did we design this? Uh, C0, the lowest frequency that you can hear um, or that humans can hear on average is about 16.35 Hertz. And then we're going to C1 um, is going to be uh, two times that and C2, two times the previous. And so that's how we're determining the frequencies. And so ultimately our consonance filters are based on non-contiguous frequency ratios. But we're gonna design these filters, not just for octaves for the pitch class C, but also for fifths and for harmonics and for all 12 pitch classes. So now I think it's really helpful to go back to the wolf versus husky example to get a sense of exactly what we are doing and what we're not doing. Um, one thing I want to point out here is we're not, these aren't handcrafted features and that we're not um, designing a specific mathematical formula to extract features for classification. Instead, um, we're kind of doing something like the following. We're saying, hey model, don't look at the, say the background colors of these images. Instead, just look at the animals themselves and learn for yourself what are the uh, distinguishing features for these different animals. We don't say to the model, oh, uh, say use eye color because we know that wolves have yellow eyes and huskies have blue eyes. We don't say focus on the length of forms, but instead we ha have the model focus on specific areas of the spectrogram in our case and uh, learn relationships that matter from those frequencies for emotion. So we're going to limit the frequencies ultimately that are input to the model. Okay, so with that, now let me get to the empirical analysis and the data sets that we've used to train the model. We're going to use two data sets. One is the soundtracks data and one is the 4Q data. Uh, the soundtracks data is data that comes from the background music of film, so film scores. And these clips uh, are 10 to 30 seconds in length. So if there's a 30 second clip, we're gonna break it down into five non-overlapping six second clips. And these songs were selected to only be instrumental, not have any uh, voice. Um, and they were also selected to be unfamiliar to listeners. And this was a very intentional decision because we know that familiarity can impact people's emotional responses. So what we get here is we get a very clean relationship between the underlying music and the emotions elicited. And we can see that here, the it's, it's an unbalanced sample. So, um, you know, very naive classifier that always predicted the majority class here should get about 36% accuracy. But of course, often music off, uh, does have vocal information. And so we're going to test the robustness of our model using this 4Q data set. This 4Q data set has many different music genres, country, pop, rock, and this was uh, designed, selected to be a balanced data set. So we're going to have 25% of our samples within each quadrant. And we're going to train a few models to compare against our own. Uh, the first will be a traditional machine learning model. It's going to be a support vector machine, and we're going to use these MFCC handcrafted features, which stands for MEL frequency sepstral coefficients. These MFCCs uh, were shown to be really successful in automatic speech recognition. And so they were transported to different music information retrieval tasks, and they showed to be quite successful for emotion as well. So we're going to use this as a benchmark. 
Um, another model we're going to compare against is what we're calling this a theoretical deep learning model. It's a CNN with square filters. So this would be your very standard model that would be used in computer vision. We're going to borrow the architecture that was designed um, with the soundtracks data in mind by Chaudhry et al. 2019. So Chaudhry et al., they're going to design the model and uh, tune the hyperparameters to do well on the soundtracks data. So they've certainly tried their best. And we are going to also try our best for our theory-based deep learning model. So we're, this is going to be a CNN with the various consonants filters. So it could be harmonics, octaves, fifths. And we're going to, um, you know, of course, set the hyperparameters uh, using some validation data to see uh, what works best. And the goal for all three of these models is to predict into for each clip, for each six second clip, which of these four quadrants the music falls into. So let's see how we do. Um, so for this soundtrack data first, if we're to take a completely naive model that always predicted the majority class, we'd expect 36% uh, accuracy. Um, in this case, it's the same as recall uh, for how we're reporting it here. And then if we're to take the SVM with the handcrafted features, those MFCCs, we do better. So here we can see there's 46% accuracy. Uh, if we then instead were to use this deep learning model, the CNN with these square filters, we do even better. We get about 59% accuracy. And if we um, use our CNN with the theory-based filters, we do... Uh, about just as well. So here, if we're looking at accuracy recall, we get about 58% accuracy. Remember here, our goal was not to improve on accuracy, but it was to maintain accuracy while gaining explainability. So um, let me talk about that next. Oh, uh, quickly, for the 4Q data, we can see that the results largely hold. So our uh, accuracy is not quite as high as a theoretical square, but the F1 is quite comparable. Okay, so now uh, let's get into the explainability portion, which is really the motivation for the design of these sorts of uh, theory-based uh, filters. And to do this, we're going to borrow from the uh, computer vision literature, we're going to borrow uh, the GRADCAM, which stands for Gradient-Based Class Activation Mapping. GRADCAM basically tells us what parts of an image most greatly contribute to a particular classification. So we have this image on the left. The question is, why is it classified? Why does a model classify it as shark? And a grad cam will, a grad cam will produce a heat map, which highlights through points of brightness what parts of an image most greatly led to a certain classification. If we superimpose this heat map on the image, then what we can find is that it's the sharp teeth that are important in classification. This matches with our intuition for why, if you know, if we were to see a shark, why we would think it's a shark. And so what this tells us is the model seems to be learning something that would generalize more broadly. So then for music, the question is, well, what is the model learning from the music that will lead to a certain emotion classification? So why is this song here classified as being high valence, low arousal? Uh, let me play it for you so you know what it sounds like. Okay, so why was this song classified as high valence, low arousal? First, here I'm showing you the MEL spectrogram and the grad cam heat map for the atheoretical deep learning model, so the square filters. The top, we have the MEL spectrogram, and the bottom, we have this heat map, which uh, shows through points of brightness why a certain uh, image, or you can think song in this case, was classified a certain way. So why was this piece here classified as being high valence, low arousal? If you look at this grad cam heat map, it's not it's not super obvious what's being learned. We don't know what uh, you know what is it. What are the features that are being used that are being learned rather to make this classification? But if we look at the theory based deep learning model with the consonants filters, then we get something that's uh, easier to understand and matches our intuition. So again, on the top we have the mouse spectrogram of the clip you listen to. And on the bottom, we have this grad cam heat map, but based on the theory-based filters um, that were learned. And what we see is that, well, 
I need to give you a little bit more background information. I guess I've seen this so many times, um, I forgot, uh, I forget sometimes. Okay, so there are a few things here. What did you hear? So you heard a string instrument that changed notes that then became really spread out in sound. And what we know about string instruments is that they produce harmonic frequencies. And what we know about harmonic frequencies is that they're associated with consonants. So what do we see? We see that there are these um, points of brightness exactly associated with these uh, strings, which we know are harmonic and consonant. So then what we can um, conclude here is that brightness identifies these points of consonants in the music. And we know that consonants is in particular associated with high valence music and with low arousal music. So again, this is um, something that fits with our intuition, fits with, fits with uh, emotion and music theory. Um, so it gives us a sense that this model is learning uh, a feature of the music that can generalize more broadly, at least within Western music. And we can also look at these images, these grad camp heat maps, not just for um, you know this one piece, but more broadly. And again, it fits our intuition. So these are... Uh, you know, these are just prototypical. If we were to uh, sum up the brightness values over the various quadrants, we still see the pattern. We see the patterns that we would expect. So, suppose we're to hold arousal fixed. The high valence music is brighter than the low valence music, and we know high valence music is more consonant. Uh, suppose we're to hold hold valence fixed and instead compare arousal. Well, the low arousal music is brighter than high arousal music, and we know low arousal music is on average more consonant. So again, this is consistent with music theory and emotion theory. And uh, there's one point I wanted to make here, um, also before moving forward, but uh, I must have cut the slide because I was um, thinking, oh, we only have 60 minutes. But I think one important point to make is the goal in designing this model was really about explainability. But what we also got from it was some efficiency or some model parsimony, which was very uh, interesting to me. So if you were to look at the number of parameters that need to be learned in this uh, a theoretical model with the square filters, it's about 5 million parameters. And this is the model that we're taking from Chaudhary et al. Um, it's very uh, standard in these CNN models for images to have so many parameters. But in our model, where we've incorporated some theory um, with for music in particular, we got it down to about uh, 51,000 parameters that need to be learned. So that's a huge difference. Um, and if you think about the cost of uh, computation and running the model over and over again, um, these differences in number of parameters that need to be learned um, will really add up. Okay, so now with that, finally, let me get back to the application, which is ultimately what motivated all of this work. And this began with some conversations with managers trying to understand um, how to think about ad insertion within YouTube videos. So within a, YouTube, within a video, there often will be emotion over time. There are many opportunities for inserting an ad. And here we're gonna think about using emotion information. But that said, this, the idea here is to show that emotion matters, but it's not to say that emotion should be used in place of everything else. Instead, you can think about emotion as one additional variable that would be useful um, in thinking uh, about ad insertion alongside other typical uh, variables that you might use, including information around, say, like demographics, behavioral information, uh, other contextual information. Um, so here, we're going to focus on emotion, however. And remember my context, you saw this slide before, we have a video that varies in emotion over time, we have an ad that also elicits a particular emotion, and the interaction of the content emotion with the ad emotion impacts ad effectiveness, and we want to understand exactly what that impact is, we're going to measure ad skip and brand recall. If we go back to behavioral literature, it's not obvious what would be more effective emotional congruence or emotional contrast. So on the one side, um, we have papers that say things like matching and persuasion, fluency might be more effective. So here you might think, oh, I should put a happy ad within a happy point of the video. But you also have other papers that um, say, okay, emotional contrast uh, might be more effective. So you could think, oh, if you're watching a really quiet show, and then you get a really loud ad <laughs> that might catch your attention. 
And you might also be more likely to say, uh, remember which brand advertise. So we're going to treat this as an empirical question and test in a lab experiment, what is the more effective strategy? To do this, we're going to follow these four steps. Um, and note here that steps one to three don't involve the model. Uh, steps one to three are uh, purely an experimental setting. So first we're going to get humans to tag the content emotion over time and the ad emotion to give us the ground truth. Ultimately, all the ground truth is coming from the human perception of emotion from music. In this case, uh, more than music, we're gonna show them the video and the ads um, more broadly. Uh, so in some sense, you can think, oh, we're gonna show them this information, but we're going to test it using only the music. Um, when it comes to the model, you know, how does it do? Then in step two, we're going to determine the emotional distance between the ad and the content over time. And then in step three, we're going to conduct the experiment. We're going to exogenously insert the ad at times of differing emotional distance, and we'll measure the ad skip and uh, brand recall for each individual to see how we do. So we're going to begin with one content video and two ads. Uh, and how do we do the tagging? Well, it's going to look something like the following. So for the content, this video spring, which is um, about eight minutes long, and it has uh, music throughout the background, but there's no audio, uh, there's no um, uh, like spoken language in it. We're going to have people watch it in 30 second segments and tell us how they feel. So if we look at this first bar, what it tells us is, okay, if we were to show a hundred people this, the first 30 seconds of this video, about say 40 of them would say it's uh, Q4 or high valence, low arousal. Maybe about four of them would say it's uh, low valence, low arousal. And the remaining, I guess, 56 of them would say it's high valence, high arousal. And we'll do this for um, you know, the whole video. And we're gonna do the same thing for the ads. Then to determine the emotional distance between each ad, and the content, and when I say each ad, I really mean the first six seconds of the ad because that's uh, it's the that you know instant interaction is what we're most interested in understanding. We're going to take the Jensen Shannon distance, and here I'm not going to get into the math, but I just want to give you some intuition. So if you have if the two distributions end up looking very similar, then we're going to get a low Jensen Shannon distance, or what we would call emotional congruence. But if instead the two distributions look really different, we're gonna get a high Jensen-Shannon distance and we're going to have a high emotional contrast. And here we, I just plot the Jensen-Shannon distances or you can think the emotional distances over time for uh, each of the ads. And so you can see um, you know, these ads, they have very different emotions. So their are uh, times of ad insertion. Um, when would be like the most say like emotionally congruent or different uh, would vary. So if we're to focus on ad one, you can see that um, the point of greatest emotional congruence would be about 120 seconds. The point of greatest emotional contrast would be about 240 seconds. So the question is, okay, where should we think about inserting this ad? If we regress um, either uh, indicator for ad view or an indicator for correct recall, on emotional distance and we control for covariates around um, say uh, the time of ad insertion and um, uh, ad fix effect. So we have ad fix effects, time block fix effect. What we see is we don't see a significant relationship between the emotional distance and the uh, probability of viewing, but we do see a significant relationship between the emotional distance and brand recall. And in particular, what we see is that emotional similarity is what improves brand recall. So now knowing this, we're going to um, go back to our original problem. And what we have is we have the ground truth. We have uh, what are the points of greatest emotional distance um, between the ads and the content based on human tagging. 
And so for our two ads, the average distance to Shannon distance is 0.21. Basically, in this case, the lower the better, given that emotional congruence is what is effective. And in this case, we see that if we were to insert the ads at those points of greatest congruence, we get about a 31% recall rate. I mean, of course, th these numbers are like 31% is extremely high. This was done in a lab setting. Um, but of course, then when we compare against the model we'll also being in a lab setting, so it'll be fair game. But of course, you shouldn't expect such high recall rates uh, more generally. If we were to use a traditional machine learning model, so this is the SVM with the MFCCs, we're going to get points in the content that are much more emotionally distant um, from the ads. And this is going to result in a lower average recall rate. And if we're instead to use the CNN models, either the uh, square model or R model, which we're calling music emotion, we're going to get uh, average Jensen Shannon distances that are, you know, not as good as human, but much better than the traditional machine learning model. And in this uh, experiment, we found that there are recall rates that were um, close to uh, what the what humans would have suggested for the ad insertion point. And so our proposed deep learning model, Music Emotion, is able to do this in real time, is scalable, and compared to the a theoretical CNN model is also explainable. Okay, so I know <laughs> I covered a lot of content. So let me quickly wrap it up um, and just give you three main points to uh, walk away with. So the first is that this paper essentially developed a theory-based explainable deep learning model that predicted emotion from the raw music data. Uh, this model was not only accurate in its predictions, but also explainable in that it gave us a sense of why the model made the predictions that it made. And then finally, we can think about using this model in the problem of automated emotion-based ad insertion. And at least in uh, our case, this model is able to achieve comparable recall rates to human emotion judgment. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you all so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Uh, that was a great talk. Thanks a lot, Contents, once again. Um, I, any questions in between? See, we, I saw a lot of PhD students who have actually uh, read this paper multiple times. So <laughs> I'm sure uh, they already have an idea. But I see Akshay, Akshay, uh, do you want to ask that question? Just one second. Yes, go ahead, please. You can ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Anuj, and uh, good evening, uh, uh, Professor Horting. Hortons. Excellent presentation. I'm, uh, thank you for sharing this work with us. I, my question is very simple and perhaps uh, uh, may sound naive. Uh, I just wanted to understand that uh, the musical theory that you used for consonance and dissonance already kind of hints towards uh, simple ratios of frequencies and mm -hmm. uh, how they lead to perceptions of consonance and dissonance. So mm -hmm. then uh, would it not be uh, useful to maybe uh, compare the workings of uh, the model that you have created with mm -hmm. another one, a simpler one, which basically extracts out the frequencies from the MEL spectro spectrogram and uh, maybe looks at the uh, ratio of uh, or the number of uh, frequencies that are falling in the uh, simple ratios and maybe come up with a very naive measure of consonants and dissonance. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is um, this is not so dissimilar. I guess in the past there have there have been many handcrafted features that have been proposed to measure things, say what they call like sensory dissonance. And so there are these handcrafted features that capture these ideas. You can think ours is um, not so dissimilar, but it allows for a lot of more flexibility in how to combine all these different frequencies. So there are all these theories around like, oh, like um, certain, like if even harmonics are played, we might feel a certain way. If odd, odd harmonics are played, we might feel a certain way. Um, and so there are many different ways to combine this information. Um, one thing we are in like the 
in the revision, so in the original paper, we used MFCCs. Um, you know, we read about this and people are like, oh, this is state of the art in many cases. So this is like a good point of comparison. But um, in the next uh, round of the paper, I guess you're going to see the use of some additional handcrafted features. Um, and so I think that that should better address your uh, point. Um, but exactly, there are ways to measure consonance dissonance, um, but there have been many proposed, which kind of gives us the sense that maybe there are many things going on here. So maybe you need a very a more flexible way to capture all of these different relationships that ultimately make us feel, um, you know, different emotions when we hear different interactions of the various uh, harmonics of uh, like notes, let's say. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for your answer. Awesome. Do we have other questions? Okay. I think uh, we were able to cover it in time. In fact, we had five minutes extra. Audience, thanks a lot once again for taking our time. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone.